What's your question or comment for Rush? That's how James Golden, better known for over 30 years as Bo Snurdly, would greet callers to the Rush Limbaugh three-hour daily radio program. Mr. Golden has written a book about his time as call screener, an official show observer, and producer with the most popular radio talk show during the past 30 years. Rush Limbaugh died on February 17, 2021. In his book, which Golden says is a tribute to his former boss and friend, he writes about his love of radio and how the Limbaugh program came together behind the scenes. James Golden, why do people in radio love it so much? I don't know. It is a when you when you get bit by the bug, and that is a common phrase you hear from radio people that they were bit. It is something that you instantly know you have to be a part of, that you want to be a part of. And for me, it is a passion that has now gone on for over forty years, Brian. And it's and and I still am passionate about it today as I was when I started. Who did you first start listening to on the radio, and how old were you? I was four. Well, I started listening to radio. I, I don't even remember. My parents always had on the radio. We listened to a combination. Growing up in New York was great. We listened to news radio, WINS and WCBS in the morning. Both were news stations. Then we listened to R&B stations, WWRL primarily, and top 40 stations, WABC and WMCA primarily. And there were other stations in between that would come and go, but those were the primary. I grew up with those stations. I don't even remember when I started listening to radio. But the first time I saw it up close, I was 14 years old. My cousin had come to New York from Buffalo, New York, to be a disc jockey. The local R&B station, WWRL, in New York was where he landed, and I went to pay a visit to him. And when I walked in that radio station, when I got behind the doors of the reception, my mouth fell open. (laughs) I was wowed. And the first thing I saw was the newsroom. And... Looking to see all the activity, that was the days where you had a separate wire for UPI, a separate wire for the AP wires, and then uh, you go from there into the control room where the music was happening. It was just, I tell you, I thought I was in heaven. It was, I knew instantly I wanted to be in radio. What was your first ever job or internship? In, well, in, in I was radio. a gopher for many years. I would hang around the radio station as much as I could just doing at running errands for my cousin, who was at that point had really established himself in New York as a preeminent disc jockey, and um, then some of the other disc jockeys. But my first hire was when I was in my uh, young 20s. I got a job as the marketing and research director. My job was to go through the ratings books and prepare reports for the station's management and to also come up with ideas for marketing and promoting the station. So that was my first real job in the business. And from there, I moved over to doing what was really new um, music research to start polling out to uh, to the broader area of listeners to find out what songs they wanted to hear. It was new. No one was really. It was only being done in a few stations around the country. So I ended up being one of the pioneers of pioneers of music research, and that led me to WABC, which was the iconic uh, top forty radio station in America. By the way, how did you research the music that people wanted to hear? I had a I had interns, and what we would do is record five seconds to ten seconds of a song on a cart machine, mostly the hooks of a song. And when we when they agreed to be surveyed, we would have each each one of these interns would have about thirty carts of music. 
and we would just play music down the line and get their reaction on a one to seven scale, whether they liked it very much or whether it was something that they were unfamiliar with or whether it was a song that they disliked. After that, we would aggregate all the numbers, and um, we had to, of course, have a statistically sound sample base so that we could arrive at a conclusion with uh, either plus three or four minus or, or plus uh, certainty, and then I would prepare the results, and we would see what's were the hot songs and what's were the mediocre and what songs people didn't want to hear, and also something else, what songs they were tired of hearing, something we call burnout. So it was pretty. It was pretty exciting time, actually. What kind of a home did you grow up in? What were your interests when you were young? <clears throat> I grew up in a two-parent, um, two-parent home in Queens. Um, my father was a World War II and Korean War veteran. My mother was a school teacher in her earlier days, but when uh, she had uh, her three kids. She stayed at home for a few years before returning back to the workforce, and then she worked with the city on um, community development projects. Uh, and we lived in a middle-class neighborhood in Queens, middle-class values. Uh, you know, church, attended church. I was in the choir. And, of course, school and education was my parents' primary concern, even sometimes, though it wasn't mine and making sure that they had well-adjusted, well-behaved, law-abiding kids. It was just, now when I look back on it, it seems idyllic. Um, it wasn't always, of course, idyllic. The, the, the throes of growing up are often filled with, you know, your, your one crisis after another. But looking back on it, it just seemed I had the perfect childhood with the perfect parents. Yeah, I got disciplined a lot for being mischievous. But um, all of it to me just seems, and now that I look back being older, I realize how incredibly blessed I was to grow up with the family that I did, in the house that I did. At that time, the country was in turmoil, but my home always felt secure. You know, we were in the, the, the opening and then the middle stages of the civil rights movement. There was a lot of turmoil going on in the country. Later on, the Vietnam era but home was always a secure place i heard you mention uh in another interview that i was listening to a comment positive very co positive comment about your grandmother which grandmother and why why were you saying positive things about her well my grandparents were amazing my grandmother i both of my grandmothers were amazing one of my grandmothers, I used to, in Buffalo, my, my paternal grandmother, I used to, um, when I was a kid, go up to see her and just spend time with her. And this was a woman, I, it still blows my mind, she had severe arthritis, but she used to get up when she knew I was, I was coming in the wee hours of the morning and start, with her arthritic hands, kneading bread so that I would have, it was my favorite the way that she used to make um, her homemade bread. And every time I would visit her, she would make sure, no matter how much pain she was in, that she had that ready. This was also a woman. I used to listen to her, Brian, pray. And these prayers would go on, and she was praying for her family, and she would pray that in the future days her family would be looked after. And I just remember being struck at some point when I was a teenager with how very deeply devoted this woman was to her faith and also just appreciative of her. But my grandmothers were amazing. And I also had the great opportunity to know my great-grandmother on my mom's side. And Granny, we called her, was one-half American Indian, and then she was black, and she had married a former slave, um, a, a man that was had, had experienced slavery. And I just, I wish I could remember the specific conversations that I had. All I know is that I would sit with Granny for hours and just talk. 
And Brian, to me, she was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen in my life, even in her 90s. She had these beautiful silver ponytails, um, a ponytail. It was just an experience. That's what I'm telling you. I had the most idyllic childhood that one could imagine. What's the story about the hoax letter at your age 17 at WWRL radio station? <laughs> well, before I, before I got a job in radio, I got an, an, a letter one day when I was 17. It was from WWRL. It was in, in their stationery. I opened up, and lo and behold, it was a job offer. I was beside myself with joy. Uh, uh, part of me wondered, wow, how did it be that they noticed me already? So I get dressed up. I have on my best suit, my tie, take the subways, make the connections, get to Woodside, get to the receptionist desk. By this point, I knew him. Barbara, I'm here for my interview. And she looks at me puzzled. What interview? I show her the letter. She calls upstairs to the program director's office. There's mum, there's silence, there's silence, there's all this. Finally, I get to go upstairs. I'm not sitting with the program director. I'm with staff, and they break it to me. We're sorry, James. This letter's a hoax. No one's offering you a job here. I was so humiliated. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. But whoever sent me that letter, I still don't know how or why it happened, but that fueled inside me a determination that one day I was going to get a job at that radio station no matter what. And, of course, that is exactly what ended up happening, and that's where my radio station career began. You make some interesting comments in your book about college. Tell us your attitude about college. I went to Queens College for a while. And I was truly, I wanted to excel. I mean, I had the bug, Brian. I wanted to be Mr. Broadcaster. I wanted to understand everything about communications. You know, the medium is the message and all of that. So I'm in class, in a communications class one day, and I'm questioning uh, what the teacher is 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 offering in the communications class, and I had some questions about it. Now, at this point, I had already started writing ad copy that was running on um, in, in for commercials. I had already been exposed to radio. I had already been exposed to some television, hanging around my cousin and hanging around some of the others in the business. So I'm dealing with the teacher. And the more I question, he's annoyed, and he's just getting angry with me for questioning everything. And finally, in front of the class, he embarrasses me by saying, you know what, you can question anything to a point. And I said, yes, I thought that's why I was here. And I picked up my books, and I left, and that was the end of my college career. I decided at that point... I'm not going to do this and waste my time. I'm going to work and learn that way by working. Who was Ed McLaughlin, and how important was he to you? Ed McLaughlin was, um, when I met him, was the president of ABC Radio Networks. Now, I had learned how to... Uh, my first job was dealing with rating, with ratings and understanding the world of ratings, but it was from a local radio perspective. I did not understand network ratings, how they were constructed on nationwide, et cetera, et cetera. So I looked one day through the ABC phone directory, found Ed's name. He was the president of the radio divi of ABC networks, picked up the phone and called his office. I told them I was an employee at the local radio station, but I wanted to know more about network ratings and how things were done at the network. And the next thing I know, I was invited. Uh, ABC Networks was across the street from us. Uh, we were at 1330 Avenue of the America, adjacent to Black Rock, a, a, a block away from the Peacock Building. 
<laughs> and uh, across the street from us was ABC Radio Networks. The next thing I know, I was sitting in a conference room and walks Ed McLaughlin with rating books. The president of this network sat down with me and explained everything to me himself. And he was so generous with his time and so nice that it, it just left such an amazing impression on me that he would do that for someone, an employee of the company that he didn't know. He certainly could have assigned somebody to do this instead of doing it himself. So Ed and I had a friendly relationship after that. It was years later when Ed had resigned as the president of ABC Radio Networks that I saw him coming into ABC headquarters one day with this guy, this guy named Rush Limbaugh he introduced me to. We all talked outside for a few moments, and I... After the, as this conversation was ending, I made a remark to both of them. I said, well, it sounds like, you know, Rush, that you're going to be bigger than Paul Harvey. Paul Harvey was the gold standard. That was the, the, as high as you could get as a radio broadcaster in those days. And Rush just, yeah, kind of, that's where I want to be. Little did I know at that time, how deeply my life would be intertwined with Rush's, and also, little did I know, the success track that Rush Limbaugh was about to get on. What was your first day on the job? What year? I don't remember. It was 56 stations the first time I was rotated on to Rush's show. Uh, there were 56 stations that were um, affiliates, and very quickly, it just started growing and growing and growing from there. As you know, he used a song by the Pretenders in uh, at the beginning of his show and sometimes during the show itself. How controversy, controversial was that, that, that song and how did he keep it in spite of the fact that at first they didn't like the fact that he was using it? Well, the pretenders, some of the pretenders did. Some of the pretenders and some of her fans didn't like it. The song is My City is Gone, and that was Rush's theme song. He would play the instrumental uh, opening of that song uh, to introduce each of his three hours. And then the publishers got involved, and the publishers had threatened a lawsuit if we continued to, to use the song. The way it got resolved, was that Chrissy Hine, who wrote the song from the Pretenders herself, granted permission um, for a fee to use the song. One of the reasons because her father was a Rush fan, and <laughs> and so and, and so the argument of of us using "My City Was Gone" as Rush's theme song was over from that point. You say in the book that Rush said you were his program observer, his Obama criticizer, and his call screener. Explain those three uh, responsibilities. Well, program observer because I paid attention to a lot of the things that Rush said and was able to recite them back at some point. Uh, I was able to remind Rush that he had talked about a particular topic that he had talked about a particular thing with a certain angle on it. And I kept, you know, careful mental notes about a lot of the things that were said on the show. So he started referring to me as the program observer, the official program observer. I did screen the calls. I took a break from that for a few, from a few years. But for most of the 33 years of the syndication, I was the person screening the calls, which was not an easy feat. Oh, because, partially because of you, Brian. Did you know that? I have not. This is the first I've heard of it. I'm, you're, not, you're blaming me or what? Criticizing me? Give it to me. Well, <laughs> here's the deal. Rush used to always ask me and others, I hear these callers on C-SPAN, and these callers on C-SPAN are so intelligent. They're so blah, blah, blah. In the, these are the beginning years. We have got to get callers that are able to articulate like the people that call on C-SPAN. 
And he set a high bar for what he wanted from his callers, and we were able to deliver. But the measure was what we were all hearing on C-SPAN, Brian, and that's real. James, talk about how you went about that job and how many calls you would take before you would put somebody on. Give us the, the, the scenario where Rush Limbaugh is sitting there, and how does he know who's calling, and give us the, your philosophy. I had we had a dual screen. He could see everything that I put up for him, which was the caller's name, their location, and a brief synopsis of what they wanted to talk about. I had two color codes that I could use: green, let's go to that person. When that person was on the air, it would turn red, so he would know who he's talking to and who was up next, which would then be the next green color. Um, and he trusted me with with scheduling, as it were, the order of the calls that were going to be used on, on the program. Um, I knew what he wanted in terms of calls, which was not just an articulate call, but he just didn't, Rush never wanted the conventional wisdom on stuff, and he didn't want cliched callers. Um, he wanted somebody, he wanted independent thinkers or calls that had something to bring. He would say a caller's job is to make me look good. That didn't mean to flatter him or praise him. Somebody that could challenge to bring out the best in him as radio host. And so that's what we strove for. It would take me sometimes um, 15 minutes, a half an hour, to find the first call of the day that I felt secure. Okay, this is my lead-off guy or gal. Uh, there were times when Rush would only take three or four calls during the day. All of them had to be excellent. There were others when he'd take a lot of calls. Again, they all had to be excellent. So I would say that um, rough average would be 80% to 90% of the calls that came in, maybe more, I declined. And we only and I was very peculiar, particular about which calls I would put on. They had to be able to get to the point and very quickly, if it was something that Rush had discussed already, and had made as, as many points on it as he, and, and you could sense it, that he didn't want to go further with the topic, then that's not the right call. He didn't want to deal with calls uh, that were conspiratorial in nature or fringe. He wanted calls that were actually going to bring out substance, substance from him and add to the substance of the show. I think um, in, in doing this book, we, I calculated... Um, and figure, I think over the years that I screened the show, I must have talked to about a million people. And, of course, we use far fewer calls than that. I'd say one out of every 10, one, of, one out of every 10 to one out of, any, of every 20 people that I talked to actually got put on hold to go into the queue. Do you have a memory of any particular call that uh, either set, rush off or brought something to the program that you didn't expect? Oh, a lot of them, Brian. We had some that were so funny. Um, and in the early days of the show, you know, it wasn't as political as it became. That shift happened after the Clinton years. We had a guy that called in. Um, he called himself Mick from the high desert of New Mexico. And he would talk about um, cooking cuisine from the wildlife. This is back when the animal rights movement was just getting getting started. And many people on the left were just appalled at Nick, but he was always so funny, and we enjoyed talking to him. Uh, then there were the calls that were serious. Uh, there were the calls that we got sometimes from, the, there was another one from the the nephew of a representative from South Dakota. And during the budget debate, this and he was a kid. He had to be no more than 13 or 14. He called primarily to tell us that his uncle was a United States representative and how much he disagreed with his uncle on everything from taxes to the way that his uncle talked about things. It was hilarious, but at the same time informative. One of, this, one of the calls that, that I took near the end, uh, Brian, will always stay with me. 
A, a gentleman called to try to explain to Rush how much that Rush meant to him over the years. And the more he tried to, the more emotional he got, he finally started almost crying. And he finally just said, look, Rush, at the end of the day, the, uh, I just want to hear your voice. And it was so emotional for all of us. And I even saw Rush tear up on, on that call because that's what this show had become for some, to so many people. It went past the politics of the day. It went past what was going on in the world at that moment. It was a chance for you to have an opportunity to communicate with someone you trusted, a friend, someone who had become a part of your life. In many cases, we had multiple generations of family members listening to the show, from young children through their grandparents or great-grandparents. It had become a fixture in American life based on the fact that Rush was able to communicate in such a way that he engendered trust and he engendered a spirit of optimism among his among his audience. And by the way, Brian, that show never stopped growing. From 56 stations after 600 affiliates, the station kept growing until uh, the time that Rush passed. And we had 27 million, I believe, uh, listeners at that point. When would you find out your ratings from... Uh any of the programs? Well, ratings in the radio business come out four times a year. Um, you get a, a spring book, what's called the spring book that comes out um, after, uh, after some, sometime before Memorial Day. Then you get the summer book, the fall book, and the, and the winter book. Of those, what happens in the fall is deemed most important because that's when advertising rates are usually set. But four times a year... So 48 weeks out of the year, radio is being, uh, is being gauged for ratings. And it's a really high-intensity business. You always have to be on your game. There's not much rest time in between. And you'll notice that most of the radio hosts take off around the same time, most because they're always under ratings pressure. And so when you get those breaks, like there's going to be a break, right after Christmas, where we're not rated for two weeks. That's when you'll find most hosts take off their vacations. But most of the year, the ratings are constant. How long was Rush's contract with, uh, was it primarily with Premier Networks? Um, Premier was a, had become a syndication partner. Now, Rush started with EFM Media. There were four broadcast partners there. At some point, that company sold part of their, the other partners sold, and Rush then became a partner with, uh, with, with J-Corps, with Clear Channel. When iHeart assumed uh, Clear Channel, then Rush's uh, I, Premier Radio Networks, which was our syndicator, became a subsidiary of iHeart, and that's how Rush moved into the iHeart family. But Rush always owned a stake in his own company and with his own partner. So he was partnering with Premier at that point and was a partner with iHeart. And by the way, that's so important because as a businessman, Rush never allowed the control of that show to go outside of his hands. And that's one of the things that he used to say from a business standpoint, in terms of the cancel culture, one of the reasons they could not cancel Rush was because he owned his own show. He was a partner in his own success. And as he would say, they did not make me. The media, no media company made him. And therefore, they could not break him. The only thing that could damage Rush's credibility was if he did something that would in that would endanger the trust that he had built up with his audience. One of the things that happened during his career that was the hardest for me to understand, and I want you to explain it, was the whole 
hearing loss that he underwent. What year did it happen, and what when did you start noticing it? And explain the depth of what happened to him. Well, those of us that listened to Rush noticed beginning in the late 90s that his voice was changing. But we didn't necessarily attribute that to hearing loss. And then, of course, he was using hearing aids. And if for people in radio, that's not so uncommon. There are many broadcasters who, because they have headphones on for years and years, and a lot of them come from a music background with loud headphones, loud music, it's not uncommon that there is some degree of hearing loss. But in 2001, it became obvious that there was a real problem with Rush. And um, I remember at the time, I was on a, a hiatus from the show, and at the time, I called him and I said, Rush, what's going on? And he said, you know, if I, he said, I really can't tell you the details. If I would, I, 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 it would just be too much. It was shortly after that I did find out that he was losing his hearing and was going deaf from an autoimmune disease. And that point rapidly came to, to, to happen that he was completely deaf in both ears. He had lost hearing in one ear at first, and then, and then it just had, a, had snowballed. And so that is when the team assembled in Florida. That's when I got on the first plane to Florida, and I, I met the other members of the people that I would spend the next 20 years with, uh, Dawn Bachinski, uh, an incredible real-time stenographer, and Brian Johnson, an engineer. And Brian and Dawn did two things. Dawn brought with it the ability to, in real time, transcribe what callers were saying to Rush and other conversations so he could read it in real time what was happening and what was being said. Brian hooked up a color code system so that Rush would know um, when spot breaks were coming or when other cues that he needed to know in order to do the show successfully. And while he waited for his cochlear, for the day of his cochlear implant surgery, Rush did the show completely deaf. And that went on for a number of months. Now, Brian, I will tell you that I have never seen anything like um, Rush doing a really complicated parody bit that required split-second timing. And when he called for it this particular day, I'm just like, you've got to be kidding. He's deaf. He can't hear any of this. He executed it flawlessly from his from the muscle memory of his listening and being so in tuned with his own internal clock and timing. It was just remarkable. And um, shortly after that period of time, he had the cochlear implant surgery. It was weeks later before they were able to turn it on. When they did, it gave Rush, he said, it, it was the experience of hearing everybody that sounds in almost in a, in a Donald Duck kind of voice. But his memory could fill in the blanks. And if he knew a song, for instance, and heard it, his memory could fill it in and give him a fair representation in his mind of what it was like. And the same with people around them. If, and he would look at you, too, because part of it was, he wanted to see you talking, but he could also hear you at that point. Remarkably, Brian, to me, Rush was syndicated for 33 years. Most of that success in that show came for over 20 years while he was completely deaf. At the time... <clears throat> What was the reaction? Because <clears throat> let's go to the heart of the matter in radio. Was there panic about the fact that he's going deaf and there's all this millions of dollars on the line? I think there had to be panic about it. I think that even Rush was um, 
You know, Dawn Baczynski, uh our stenographer, tells us a very poignant story that after she did a session with Rush, when she was first calling, she didn't even know who he was. She thought it was just a one-day assignment. And it turned out to be much more than that. But after, and they had tried several stenographers before that just could not keep up, that couldn't keep up with, with the conversation. But Dawn was such an expert at this. After she came in and she was able to, in real time, offer transcriptions almost to the second of what was being said, Rush came out to her and was a little bit teary. And he thanked her and he said, now... I know I'll be able to do this and to continue my career. And that it, so he had to be worried about it. And, of course, if you're in, in the business, and you, I, I'm assuming there was all sorts of panic, not to mention what would happen to these 600 affiliates who were all depending on this show. So it was a humongous risk that they took staying with it and just having the confidence to do it, but it really did pay off because, again, for the next 20 years, the show continued to grow with Rush Limbaugh performing amazingly uh, every single day. I, I don't know anything about cochlear implants, but I know that you could see the device attached to his head or anybody that has them. Were you able to plug in directly into the cochlear implant for him to hear the callers? The, Brian set up a system that rushes that rush could plug in instead of headphones. He could plug into the audio sources in the studio, so he was able to yes hear the callers and hear what was going on with the other elements of the show. And then he would unplug and then wait for a few minutes and then plug back into a battery pack, and he would be able to hear the people around him when he wasn't on the air. Yes, it was a pretty clever bit of engineering. All right. When did you get your very important name, Bo Snurdly? First day rotated onto the show. There were other Snurdlies, but no one remembers them <laughs> because they came and they went so quickly. So <laughs> my first day on the, on, on the show, uh, I walked in with some stories for Rush to take a look at. I, you know, I had been doing that even before I started working on the show. If I saw something I thought he might be interested in, I'd just, hey, you know, walk it down to him. So I walked in the studio, hey, Rush, I saw some stories you might want. And he looks, he says, hey, well, you're on the show. You know you have to be a snurdly, right? No. <laughs> well, you do. What snurdly do you want to be? This is maybe five, ten minutes before the show starts. Back in those days, we had newspapers. And on his desk was the Daily News back page story was something that Bo Jackson had done to earn the headline. I saw the name Bo. I said, oh, Bo. Little did I realize that uh, 33 years later, I would still be Bo Snurdly. How many people call you that today? Oh, the Rush fans call me that. In fact, sometimes they, what do I call you? Do I call you James or Bo? I answer to both, and I'm honored to answer to Bo. And so a lot of the fans of the show that know me as Bo, that's what they call me. Um, and even some of the politicians that I've interviewed on my own show, um, I'm, I'm doing radio now on WABC, but even some of them still refer to me as Bo because that's how they know me. If somebody wants to listen to your current show, where do they go and at what time? Uh, I am on every afternoon on WABC Radio in New York, and there's an app, uh, uh, WABCRadio.com. You can go find the app, and I'm there six days a week, Monday through Friday at 4 Eastern time in the afternoon, and on Saturday mornings at 8 o'clock in the morning. Some questions about you. Are you really a vegetarian? Been a vegetarian for most of my life, yes. Why? Um, it was a spiritual decision for me. And, you know, I was one of those kids who was a picky eater. Well, I'll tell you, one of the things that helped, when I was young, I was at my grandparents' house in Alabama. One of my cousins killed a chicken in front of us, beheaded it, and I was appalled. My great-grandmother cleaned it. I was standing next to her as she was preparing it. 
I remember saying, wow, this is not something or thinking something to the effect of, wow, this is pretty dirty work. I was still a kid. So we're sitting down for Sunday dinner. I have a, a, a chicken, um, the, uh, the drumstick in my hand. I'm eating it. Someone makes the remark that the chicken is so fresh and so good, the one that Cousin Dude killed yesterday, and I drop it out of my hand. I'm a city boy. I thought the chicken we were eating came from the store. I had not connected it to actually seeing this chicken being killed yesterday. And immediately, it, um, that it really had a profound effect on me. But I continued to eat certain, um, certain meats for years and years before I decided that I just didn't, quote, unquote, no pun intended, have the stomach for it. I would rather not eat anything that required the taking of a life um, except for the life with the least amount of consciousness, which would be plant-based foods. So I made that decision when I was 17, and my mom, a saint, uh, decided that since she had one of her three kids that went vegetarian, she was going to learn how to really excel at vegetarian cooking, and she did. And um, it was just, uh, um, and then later my sister became a vegetarian as well. So, but it was, yeah, it was a conscious decision based on me not wanting to take life you unnecessarily. Say, you say in your book, I decided to apologize to the women I dated for my dishonesty and for my respecting them in the way they deserved, for not respecting them in the way they deserved. Why did you put that in your book? It was an important thing for me to just fess up to, Brian. I have been, a, I was a womanizer for many years. I lied to women um, and, 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 and all the rest of it. And then I had a friend um, that helped me walk through my own life in that regard and just kind of didn't let me off the hook with whatever excuses I was making. And I realized in order for me to really become the person that I should be and wanted to be that I really did owe some of the women that I dated an apology for the way that I behaved. And so I did that. And to me, it, it became something that now is, um, is I'm glad I did it. And it helped me change my life and change from being kind of a rogue. Look, I was a victim, not a victim, scratch that, never a victim. I was conditioned as well by what I thought was some of the glamour of this media life. My cousin, I mentioned um, a disc jockey, he was a notorious playboy. Um, if you look at some of the movies that I thought were influential when I was growing up and the lifestyle, it all involved being a playboy, being you know, swab, debonair, and all that stuff. And I bought into that hook, line, and sinker. And I knew at the time that it wasn't right, but I did it anyway. And that was a conversation that I had to really have, you know, asking for forgiveness, not only from the women, but from God, from the way that I was living my life. It wasn't right. And um, it's kind of you know, even still painful to talk about, but I had to change, and I'm glad that I did. Have you ever married? I was married very briefly um, in my late 20s, and um, as it turns out, uh, it lasted very, I wasn't mature, and but it was still a very painful divorce, and it it kind of just left me in a position where I did not do it again. And when I finally met a woman that I wanted to marry again, she just wanted to be friends. And so it was kind of a limbo. That's that. So I'm single. Have you ever had any children? I have a daughter who is the light of my life. Um, and she is just the most remarkable a person, um, we had a rough time of it for a few years, a lot of years, and then we had a chance to really get to know each other, and um, it just, to me, that was the answer to, uh, to, to prayers, a lot of prayers that that relationship could be 
strengthened, and it was. Um, and we're very close now. She's the light of my life. She's my ally. She's my friend. She's my daughter. And I just love her unconditionally. Now, you have a chapter in here, or at least a section of a chapter, on guest hosts, which you were responsible for when Rush was not there. <clears throat> I want to admit of my own prejudice. I, I listen to a lot of talk radio all across the spectrum. And I can never remember listening to anybody's program and liking the guest hosts. It just never works for me. And I want you to tell me why that's the case and have you heard that from anybody else? I have heard that from a few people, but I will tell you that our audience really did enjoy the guest host. Number one, because Rush took off so rarely. So this was a guy that never really used all of his vacation time, quote unquote, because he loved what he was doing. But our audience fell in love with a lot of our guest hosts. The late Walter E. Williams was not a radio guy, and he was um, economist. And it, our audience totally fell in love with him, as with all of them. Mark Stein, many of the guest hosts that we had went on to do other things. Tony Snow, of course, who you know we still mourn. He was such a wonderful human being. Um, and, of course, we've had a plethora of, of guest hosts now that, like Ken Matthews, Jason Lewis, Todd Herman, and all of them attracted audiences in their own markets and then were able to translate the things that, that led to their success into being successful guest hosts for Rush Limbaugh. Of course, a segment of the audience only wanted to hear Rush. So there would be a drop-off when he wasn't there. But I, we're pleased to say the drop-off was within reason. It wasn't a massive drop-off. Most of our audience, the overwhelming majority, stayed with us when we had guest hosts on the air. How many people getting ready for this afternoon show? How, how many people worked on this program uh, on a regular basis? Oh, goodness. We had, <coughs> excuse me, um, we had an engineer in New York who's been with us from the beginning, Mike Mamone, and an engineer in Florida. And then it was just the other two of us in the studio with Rush. But we had a web crew of about five people, always that handled the web. Our newsletter crew was about another four or five people uh, headed by Diana Aloko, who came to us from the Reader's Digest early on. And then we had, of course, a sales force. But from the, the, the we had a total about 25 to 30 people that were the core crew. Now, some people worked on the show, for instance, in sales, but did not necessarily work for the company, but they worked for the company that we contracted to help do or, or, or to work with the sales. But immediately our staff was about 25 to 30 people working with the, with the show and with the newsletter. When did you first learn that Rush Limbaugh had cancer? The day he announced it to, to the world. Um, he, we got called into a meeting that morning, which was very rare for us to get called into a meeting at all knew instantly something was wrong. Um, Rush, um, we went to the media room in back of our Southern Command, as we call it, studios in Florida. Rush came in, and we had the rest of the staff on the phone, uh, conferenced in, and that's when Rush told us that he had had a diagnosis of advanced lung cancer, and it was confirmed. And, Brian, he apologized to us which I just thought was just, I, I just couldn't take it emotionally. I mean, here's a guy that's on, on what has to be one of the most difficult days of his life, giving us an apology because he feels like he has let us down. And it was just so heart-wrenching, and it still is. Rush then went back into his studio, prepared for his show, and for the next two hours and 45 minutes, you wouldn't know that anything was wrong, the show was flawless, 
and then at a quarter to at, at quarter to the hour, um, in the last hour of the show, he broke the news to his audience. Where did he have his cancer? I know you had prostate cancer and came up here in the Washington area to be treated. Uh, but where did, where was he treated during the time he was that he treated was treated in his- Boston? And I'm not sure of the particulars because he and Catherine, of course, are very private and kept and kept a lot of the details private. But he did say that we did know it because he did talk about that, that his treatment was in Boston. And what impact did his treatment have on him when he came back to do the show? Could you tell that he had been treated? Um, there were times when he wouldn't come back right away the first day or two afterwards, even though he wanted to. And we were put on alert a day or two. You know, he might be back tomorrow. In some cases, that didn't happen, so we would have to have guest host standing by. When he did come to work, you could not tell anything was amiss from hearing the show. When, 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 the, when that on-air light came on, Rush was just as high energy as he always was just as optimistic, cheery, witty, funny, and well-prepared, had, had done the show prep required to actually deliver that day show, you wouldn't know anything was wrong. After the show was over, uh, Brian, Dawn, and myself, we were the ones in there with him. We could see the impact that it had on him. There were days where he could barely move, and he would I cannot move. He was totally drained. He had given it all. You know, Brian, that to me is is, is a point. Um, I know if I was given that death sentence, as much as I do love this business and I love radio, I love it. But I think that I would spend my the time that I had left seeing things in the world that I hadn't seen or spending time doing some other things. Rush had a bucket list, and that bucket list was his audience. Every single day that he was not in treatment, or suffering the effects of treatment. He was in front of that microphone, and his execution of his his broadcast was flawless. His bucket list was his audience, and he left nothing on the table. When did you ever see him mad, either mad at somebody or mad at you? If he did something that... <laughs> If you did something that he thought screwed up his show, you catch hell. I mean, um, I got it uh, uh, like a year or two ago when um, was, I had three bad calls in a row. Now, that never happens to me, but it happened. And Rush hit the IFB and said, you know what? If this is the best you can do, you might as well go home. I was, I was, <laughs> oh, my goodness, I was so hurt. But at the same time, you know, I understood, and this is one of the things I loved about Rush, he never stopped caring about the excellence, about producing excellence. Every show, he wanted to be excellent. And so what I did then was I told him, no, I'm not going home, and I just wiped every single call off that I had and started all over again, and we ended up today okay. Um, but it was a t- that was a tough day. But it was it was things like that. You could see him get mad if something wasn't up to the level of excellence that he expected. He would not take that well. You were a ratings guy. Uh, how long did the average person listen to his program? I'm sorry. How long did he have? No. How long? I mean, <clears throat> as you know, you can tell from the ratings how long people listen. On a given, I mean, oh. he. In, but by the way, back in 1992, the only time I ever met him, I interviewed him at the Democratic National Convention right there in Madison Square Garden. And in the program, he said, "I have 12 million listeners a week, three million at any given time." And that was in the early days when he had 150 affiliates or whatever it is. What happened to that audience? And that audience kept growing. Now I would have to go back and look to give you the exact numbers. I know that number that was the 12 million number became 27 million. Now, how many millions at any given time? I'd have to really go back. I don't want to give the wrong answer to that. But that kept growing exponentially, too. Rush Limbaugh's show grew with, I think maybe maybe there was a year that it, that it did not. It plateaued for a moment. 
But for the most part, that show grew every single year he was on the air. It didn't stop growing, which is a phenomenal feat in the radio industry. But did you ever see an account of how long somebody would stay with the program? You know, like 20 minutes, an hour? Yeah, time spent listening. We call that a TSL. Yeah. And again, I don't want to give the wrong number, so I'd really have to go look to get it accurate. But his TSL numbers were always great. People would stay and listen for, you know, I would say, I don't want to give the wrong number, but I would say that they exceeded most expectations where people will come in on a three-hour show and only listen for anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes. I believe it well exceeded that. Now, I know you're not going to disagree with this, but it's strong that the people hated him. Do you remember, I mean, they also loved him, but they hated him, and do you remember who might have shown that they hated him the most, and obviously that would be probably in politics or from the media or entertainment world? Well, it's hard to say who hated the most because the left has so many haters, and they hate with such venom. I will say that the hatred that they have, though, is unfounded. If you look at most of the things that they cite, it's clear that the people that hated him did not listen to the program or were citing something that they used as a basis for their hate that was taken out of context. Because the things that Rush said to me were not controversial. And, and you had groups like Media Matters who would, who would joyfully and willfully take a line that was said on the program out of context. And then you have lazy journalists in America who would just repeat those things verbatim. You know, Brian, it's, look, I hate making accusations against people and, and, and delving into all that stuff, but I will give you one example early on. And I still use AP as a source, um, but I remember early on in the program, the AP uh, was targeted by some group fairness and accuracy or something like that and whatever they call themselves, and they came up with this list of supposed things that Rush lied about. And the AP ran with the story. Rush and his team, I was there, I witnessed this, meticulously went back and sourced every single one of those things and sourced the material. And AP refused to run the refutation. So a lot of the stuff that was conjured up in the media was based on, on disinformation, most of it I think willful, I can't prove that, but certainly a lot of the hatred also came from people that didn't bother to listen to the program. They didn't know, they didn't know what was going on on the program. You know, um, you talk about death in your book. Uh, you point out that Prince died in 2016, and then you go through a, three different people. Well, actually, one of them's not a person. You say on February the 15th, Stumpy died, Rush died the next Wednesday, and your mom died three weeks later. Uh, what impact did all that have on you? And who was Stumpy? Stumpy was my pet parrot let. Uh, Stumpy was a special needs bird. Um, when I had, I had had birds, I had his mom, Bon Bon, and, um, and Pretty Boy, his, his father, um, and Stumpy got caught in his nesting material. His mom tried to save him and inadvertently made him a cripple. Both of his um, legs had to be ampu were amputated by her trying to get him out and half of a wing. So Stumpy lived in an aquarium. I brought Stumpy to work with me when this just happened because I wanted to keep him all day so I could monitor him. And Rush came in and, and, and said, wow, what's that in your hand? It was my little bird. And Rush did a monologue on Stumpy about the will to live and how everything is fighting in this universe, in the world. They, we want to live. This is part of life. Stumpy stayed with me almost for 20 years. Um, and the oldest and, and, and the last of my, my parrotlets. Um, the week that Rush died, Stumpy, I looked and I saw he was starting to deteriorate, but that Monday... Stumpy died, and as I said, that Wednesday, Rush passed away, and then two days later, my mom passed away. I think I've never had a week like that in my life with just um, profound, 
profound grief one after the other. It was just a, a week that I will always remember. But it also is a week that now um, gives me a sense of gratitude for, you know, I, we had rushed for 33 years, and he was just the most amazing person. My mom was, to me, a saint. And, um, you know, it's funny, Brian, I, I say that I remember my, I have a first memory of my father. I was uh, sitting on his lap in our kitchen, and he was reading me a book. I don't have a first memory of my mother because from the very moment that I began this journey, my mother has always been with me. And I, I still think that she's with me right now and my dad. But, you know, your mom, I mean, mom's is something special. Our guest has been James Golden, or as it says on his book cover, a.k.a. Bo Snurdly. The title of his book is Rush on the Radio. We thank you very much, Mr. Golden. Thank you so much, Brian. What an honor, Mr. Lamb, to be with you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org. 